Welcome everybody. I wanted to welcome you today to our Lunch and Learn series. The topic for today is nurse practitioner graduates in preparing for your new careers. Our, present, our presenter today will be Deborah Dillon. Before we get started with our presentation, I just wanted to walk everybody through uh, some logistics for today. The webinar is being recorded and will be available in the upcoming week on our Nurse Practitioner Support and Alignment uh, portal page, and a link will be sent to all registrants. All participants will be muted throughout this presentation. Presenter. A survey will pop up at the end of the webinar and will be sent out in an email later today. Please take a few minutes to complete this survey, evaluating our, as your feedback is critical to us in the, in the ongoing development and presentation of all of our webinars. The slides for today's webinar are available as a handout as seen here, which you can access via the handouts pane in your control panel. You can click on the name of the handout and it will, do, it will download via your default browser. At this time, I'd like to turn this slide over to my colleague Joseph at the AANP who will tell you how to receive free credit for this uh, offering today. Joseph? Hello everyone, Joseph here from the American Association of Nurse Practitioners. Uh, today's webinar is accredited for continuing, continuing education credit. Uh, there are a couple of requirements uh, for the participants in today's webinar in order to receive CE credit. You must attend at least 55 minutes of the presentation and by attend, we define that as viewing the presentation uh, in real time, slide by slide as the presenter presents the information. So if you only phone in today, you will not qualify, unfortunately. Uh, participants who do qualify will receive a personal email from me in about one to two days with specific CE steps uh, on how to claim your credit on the AANP CE Center. Uh, part of that process requires that you complete an evaluation on the CE Center. And just to clarify, the webinar survey that you receive at the end of today's presentation to evaluate the presentation is not part of the CE process. That survey is entirely different uh, and unrelated to the CE accreditation process. Uh, so if in the meantime, the next one to two days, if you have any questions or concerns, you can email me directly at jreyes at aamp.org. Thank you, Joseph. And again, just to reiterate that there will be a survey at the end of today's presentation on the on the presentation itself, we would ask uh, for the Nurse Practitioner Support and Alignment Network that you complete that, and that is different than uh, what you will be doing in order to apply for your CE credits. So let me talk for a minute about um, the ongoing investment in quality improvement uh, that's taking place in the United States with the help of the federal government and the organizations who are presenting this content today as, as part of the Transforming Clinical Practice Initiative. Transforming Clinical Practice Initiative, or TCPI, is CMS's largest ever investment in practice transformation with an investment of over $700 million over four years and an enrollment of 150,000 plus providers across the country. The NNCC, which is the organization that I am with, the National Nurse-Led Care Consortium, is a membership organization with nurse-led practices on our membership roster. Our mission is to advance nurse-led care through policy, consultation, and programs to reduce health disparities and to meet people's primary care and wellness needs. Our partner in this initiative, the American Association of Nurse Practitioners, is the largest full-service national professional membership organization for NPs of all specialties. The AANP is leading the way in advocacy, continuing education, and professional development for over 80,000 members. The NNCC and the AANP agree that this initiative is important to ensure that all nurse practitioners and other providers receive the support they need to remain competitive in a changing healthcare landscape. NPs are the future of primary care in the United States and already provide high quality and cost-effective care. 
This initiative is an opportunity for NPs to prove that by helping CMS and the broader healthcare community build the evidence based on practice transformation while preparing for value-based reimbursement. And at this time, I will turn over the presentation to Deborah Dillon, who will be talking to you about preparing for your new career. Deborah? Well, thank you. And I'd like to thank AANP for inviting me today. And I'd like to welcome all of you for um, attending during your lunch break, or hopefully your lunch break. Just as there were multiple steps to complete prior to graduation, there are multiple steps for you to complete before you begin employment as well. And those are the steps that we're going to talk about today. So we're going to start by identifying coursework strategies that prepare an NP student for graduation. Explain the necessary steps that prepare an NP student for the certification and licensing process. And then last, identify strategies that will assist new NPs in the employment process. Obviously, there are many activities that you completed during your academic, academic program that prepare you for graduation. And you might think that after graduation, you will never have the need for any of these items. So some of the documentation during your program, like your course syllabi and your class schedule, are something that you want to think about now, putting into an electronic folder or maybe a hard copy into another file. Because on employment or your credentialing, there may be something that was unique about your program that you can have supportive documentation by having the syllabi and class schedule, as well as the clinical hour component there. Uh, there are many nurse practitioner programs across the country and many, for example, family nurse practitioner programs. And I can look at the one in my part of the, the state and go to the southern part of my state. And even though the programs all meet certain core requirements, there's still a lot of diversity in those programs. And an example of this might be that um, maybe your program had a focus in palliative care, and that's the area you would like to work in post-graduation. And so you would then have your syllabi and your class schedule, as well as your clinical hours to support that you did have this additional um, didactic in your program. And not all programs offer that. So that would be a plus for you. And again, supporting your um, appropriateness in your um, future career choice. So I'm not sure how long after graduation you have access to your um, school websites to obtain this data. So that's why I'm saying now might be a good time to create an electronic file with this data in or again, to print out a hard copy. Your clinical hours, all of you have a minimum clinical hour requirement that your program sets, as well as a minimal number of clinical hours that are required to sit for your board certification exam. And you have to have documentation of, of that. One system that I know a lot of um, NP programs utilize is Typhon because it helps you organize this data but if you don't have a program such as Typhon, you might want to create your own Excel spreadsheet or a file, again, that includes things such as the clinical site and specific preceptor information. Typhon data is also something that is only available to you for a limited time after you complete your program, and that varies program to program. What I'm familiar with is usually students have about a one-year access to their Typhon data after graduation, and then after that time frame, they can purchase access to that on, on their own, or again, take that data and transfer it into a file. Um, and while we're just talking about documentation, I just wanna take a few seconds here to talk about pharmacology requirements, and I will address this a little bit further on as well. The pharmacology requirements vary from state to state, and in some states, you have to apply, apply for prescriptive um, privileges. And your pharmacology course in some states has to 
been taken within a certain time frame. So if for some reason you had a life event occur and you took your pharmacology very early in your program, and by the time you're asking to apply for prescriptive authority, a three or five year time frame is gone, they may ask you to um, provide an updated pharmacology course. Now, now, don't panic. That doesn't mean you have to go back to your academic setting and repeat pharmacology, which most of us can remember like that was yesterday. But they may approve a CE course for you to take. But before you take that course, talk to your board of nursing and make sure that they approve that. So just something to keep in mind if you've taken the pharmacology course earlier that you may run into that um, little dilemma. But organized tracking of all this information will save you a lot of time later. Next, I just have an example of a, a documentation log. And you want to, of course, have the date or time intervals where you performed your clinical site hours. What was the practice site, the address, who were the preceptors and what were their credentials? And then how many hours did you spend with each of the clinicians? And then you wanna keep a running total of those hours as well. Next we'll talk about um, the certification exam. And the recommendations from the certifying bodies is that you start to develop a study plan for your exam about six months before graduation. Um, and I don't profess today to tell you how to study best because I think by the time you're in your graduate or doctoral programs, you have developed your study patterns. But you might wanna think about various ways of studying. I know some of us study best as an individual and we might benefit from uh, purchasing the DVDs or study materials that are available from some of the um, well-known certifying agencies that have the review courses. Um, you might also consider studying in a group um, and say if you picked a topic like cardiovascular for the week, each member presented some session of the cardiovascular component for the exam review. And again, you might also consider a certification exam review course and the dates and offerings are readily available online. And I know some programs, the students would never think of taking their certification exam without a review course. And in other programs, everybody just kind of does what they feel is most appropriate for them and their learning needs. So now that we're talking about um, the certification exam, a lot of questions start to come up. What certifying body do I choose? And I would direct you to your faculty for recommendations. Um, for example, for the uh, acute care nurse practitioner certification, there are only two certifying bodies for that exam. So I spend significant time talking with my students about what are the pros and cons for each um, certifying body, and then the students make their own personal choice. Um, uh, you want, might also, when you're looking at which certifying agency to, to choose, please take a peek at their certification renewal requirements and weigh that into your decisioning as well. And I know that renewal of your certification is you know, five years, six years away. But that time goes by very quickly and you don't want to be kind of disappointed or caught off guard at the renewal time that, geez, I didn't know they were going to ask me to do this. I might have picked the other agency, et cetera. So just kind of give a glance at that. Your application for testing or applying for the certification exam, it's recommended that you complete that two to three months prior to taking your exam. So if you're graduating in May, you may want to think about when, it, when am I actually thinking of taking this exam? Am I going to take it as soon as graduation or am I going to take that one month respite, relax, review and take my boards in July? So whatever date you pick, back that up by two to three months and at that point in time, start your application process. The applications are available to be completed online and it's a great idea to pay attention to detail when completing the application. Um, a completed application assists in minimizing the amount of application review time. 
When you complete your application, they will also request official grade transcripts to be submitted with that. Official transcripts are those that are submitted by the university's registrar's office. They come in a separate sealed envelope to the certifying agency, and they usually have a letter attached to them that say attached is an official transcript. You may want to check with your university's registrar office to see how quickly after graduation official transcripts are available. A couple of things that on your end impact on the release of official transcripts and that is that you have met all of your course requirements, taken all of your exams, completed your clinical hours, as well as something called completing paying of fees and fines, et cetera, that might be outstanding. So. A lot of universities are really good and they have a very quick turnaround time on this, but this can be one of the delays in getting your application completed as they're still waiting for official transcripts. They will also require a photocopy of your RN license or they will ask for an electric, um, electronic copy to be submitted um, to them. And then you have a a receipt of the completed application, you're going to want to make a copy so that you have one on file for yourself. As far as the eligibility notice, it varies between certifying bodies. Um, the American Nurses Credentialing Center or ANCC states that you usually will receive notification that your application was received within two weeks. Within six weeks, they'll send you an eligibility letter or a letter requesting additional information. If you receive your eligibility letter, that means that everything was completed correctly and the process was done in a timely manner. Your eligibility to notice to test says that you must take your exam within 90 days of receipt of that letter. AANP notifies the candidates once all your materials have been approved, and that can be three to six weeks. Um, at that time, you receive notification from the Professional Exam Services, or PES, and you receive an authorization to test. And that gives candidates 120 days to schedule your um, certification exam. All certification exams require an application fee to be submitted at that time. And if you haven't joined a professional nursing organization to date, this might be the time that you really wanna think about doing that because you will get a reduced exam fee if you belong to a, a professional organization. And if you join that professional organization as a student, even the last day you're a student, you get a student rate which is reduced as well. So just to give you an idea of how much you might save, if you take the ANCC certification exam and you're a member of the American Nurses Association, that's $100 off of your exam fee. If you're an AANP member, you'll save um, $50. So just I would strongly encourage you to consider belonging to some organization, one because it's the right thing to do, but the other is that you do get a reduction on a lot of these um, NP services. So what about testing day? A couple things to be said about that. And I would refer a lot of you to the Prometric Test Center um, website online because they do provide a lot of supplemental information regarding testing day. Uh, but to go back to your application for just a minute, when you complete your application, uh, make sure that the two forms of identification that you're going to present on testing day, your name matches that exactly. And so when you get your attestation to test, just confirm that those two forms of ID match. And one form of identification will be a photo ID. So for most of you, that will probably be your driver's license. If those do not match, you will be turned away on testing day. The other recommendation I have regarding testing is um, consider taking a test drive to your testing site prior to the exam day. And I would recommend taking that drive at the same time of day that you're planning on taking your exam. So if your exam is going to be at 8 a.m., 
do the drive so that you know what traffic is like at 7, 7.30 in the morning. If you do that test drive you know, a couple weeks in advance, you might want to, if you can, go a day or so in advance just to make sure there is not any construction that you need to be aware of because you must arrive 30 minutes prior to exam time. If you arrive any later, they will not allow you in and allow you to take the exam. Travel light that day because you're not able to take really anything in with you. Um, if you have a watch on, you will be handed a locker key to put your personal items in a locker. If you wear glasses, they will have you remove your glasses and examine them. You're not allowed to take your iPhone or any personal items into the, um, the testing room once your testing is started. And again, I'd refer specifically to their website because they have a lot of good information there and they actually allow you to kind of test drive what it would be like answering the exam, looking where the question number is, where the timer is on the screen, et cetera. So the certification exam, what is unique about that? Um, there are a lot of differences between the exams and I just have listed there some examples of what total amount of questions each exam has. Remember that um, all of the exams usually have a certain number of beta questions that they're trialing for future exams. So you might have 200 questions, but maybe 175 are actually those that you are, um, they're going to base your certification on. So the time allotted for exam varies based on the total number of questions that your exam has. At the completion, there's a screen that comes up and notifies you of your exam passage status. Um, on your certification application, you should have been asked a question, um, what State Board of Nursing do you want your results forwarded to? Some certifying agencies send a free copy to one State Board of Nursing. The second State Board of Nursing, there's like a $25 charge that goes with that. Some certifying agencies automatically send the notice to the Board of Nursing. Others, you have to request that the official um, certification letter be submitted to the Board of Nursing. So please be sure you know which certifying exam you signed up for and what their requirements are. Um, we'll talk just a minute about what if you fail the exam because none of us are going to, you're not going to fail the exam, you're going to pass it the first time, but sometimes things happen and you have to retake the exam. So I've just given you two of the certifying bodies um, requirements for if you have not successfully passed. And um, the AANP requires 15 hours of continuing ed addressing the area of weakness. So again, if you did poorly in cardiovascular, they, you will have to have proof that you've had 15 continuing ed hours in cardiovascular area. ANCC says you can retake after 60 days, but you can't retake the exam more than three times in any 12 month period. And they have specifics on their website about retaking the exam time frame and other details and, and charges, et cetera. So just a kind of a little fun fact sheet on um, the certification exams. Again, trying to help you decide which one do I, which certifying body do I sign up for? And so these are just some of the statistics and per AANP, if you just look at that center column and quickly add it up, you can see that there were over 23,000 new NPs that completed their academic programs and sought certification in the 2016 year. So just start at the top, AACN, the American Association of Critical Care Nurses, they certify only one type of nurse practitioner and that's the acute care nurse practitioner. In parentheses there is how they word their um, initials after certification. If they are a relatively new certifying body compared to the others that we'll talk about, but in 2016, they certified 541 uh, acute care nurse practitioners, and their first time pass rate was 73.4%. ANCC certifies many, many different types of nurse practitioner specialties, 
they certified over 10,000 in 2016. I didn't get a first time pass rate for um, specifically their exams, but they had a total pass rate of 8,659. And again, it wasn't specified if that was first pass or you know, the, an eventual pass. I did read an article though that I provided in your references um, talking about passage on a family nurse practitioner exam because it was an article that was saying which which certifying body which certifying exam should you take. So for ANCC, the FNP first time pass rate was 75%. AANP, the first time pass rate was 81.6%. And they do give the adult general primary care first time pass rate of 75.7. So what does that mean? Does that mean because the number's higher, that's an easier exam, that's what I should take? Um, that is not what that means. But I know a lot of people look at those numbers and say, I'm going to take AANP because I'll, I'll have a better likelihood of passing. So, so another way of comparison Comparing the exams, um, ANCC's exam usually has more questions that are focused on professional issues like healthcare policy and ethics. The ANCC exam has a maximum of 500 points. So remember your raw scores are converted to scale scores. So you may only have 175 or 200 questions, but then that's converted to a um, scale score. So the maximum is 500 points. You must score 350 or higher to pass the ANCC exam. So then let's move to application for licensure. And this is something else that varies um, by state, but you've passed your NP certification exam. Now you're ready to apply for state licensure. And this is another um, separate application that's submitted to the Board of Nursing. It's a, an online application and the packets are available on the Board of Nursing websites. You also um, will have a fee associated with that application as well. Once your application is processed by the Board of Nursing, you will be issued a separate NP license and that will show up on the, the website for validation. And when you look at your website with your name specifically, you will see your RN license and a separate um, NP license. And most employers will not consider that they can allow you to work as an NP until this official posting is on the Board of Nursing websites. So you can take them a printed copy from the Prometric Center and you can celebrate and you know be happy that you passed your exam, but we technically can't do much more than that until it's officially through the Board of Nursing and that license is uh, posted. So now you have a whole extra set of initials to place after your name in, in addition to your MSN or your, your DNP or PhD. How do you display those initials? And ANCC has recommendations for that. And you should always have your highest degree after your, your legal name. So whether that's an MSN, DNP or PhD, the rationale for that is you've earned that. Nobody can take that away from you. That will always be there no matter what you do. But all of the other initials that we place after our degree, they can go away if we choose not to renew our um, certifications or our licenses. So after your legal name, next should be registered nurse. Then your advanced practice nursing certification initials, whatever they are, those are assigned by the certifying body that you sat for their exam. And then you can list your other RN nursing certifications there. And the sequence for those does not really matter. Some people list them alphabetically, some list them by the, you know, the date that they achieved them. And so the example is, is there below. So for Jane Smith, you really don't have to say Jane Smith, PhD, MSN, we kind of already know that's the trajectory that you took. So just your highest degree is, is appropriate. And if by chance you're fortunate enough to be a nursing fellow, that goes at the end of all of your other nursing certifications. 
So again, a little bit more about prescriptive authority. Um, you really need to know what your specific requirements are for the state in which you're practicing. All 50 states have prescriptive authority. Um, I would refer you to the Board of Nursing website in the specific state for the details. In some states, it requires a separate application and fee. In order to apply for prescriptive authority, though, you have to have a practice address. So you can't really apply for a prescriptive authority in the states that require it until you have an employer. And so you want to renew, review your pharmacology requirements as well, because states vary on what they accept as pharmacology requirements. And I talked about this a little bit earlier, that they may have required your basic course to be within three to five years of you applying for prescriptive authority. So one other thing that I will mention with this is if you attended a, your NP program in one state, you probably were kind of guided in a direction of what that state's requirements were for prescribing. But maybe you're going to be practicing in another state after graduation. Do familiarize yourself with the specific state requirements um, just so that you don't get yourself into trouble. And don't assume that what I did in one state is the same um, in, another, in another location. So what about controlled substances? Um, and again, this level of prescribing varies state to state. So again, I would refer to the specific state that you'll be practicing in for their um, prescribing requirements. To prescribe controlled substances, you will require a DEA number, which is Drug Enforcement Agency number. And that is a federal license. Previously, we've just been talking about state, um, state required licensing. So again, this is a separate application. The DEA does not supersede state requirements for prescribing. So in most states, if you, when you wanna prescribe controlled substances, you have to have a DEA, but you may also have to have another certificate to prescribe to prescribe other types of medications. You will be issued a separate license number for your DEA, and most states require a DEA. Your DEA number is displayed on all prescriptions. And in order to complete your application for a DEA, you also must have a practice address. You can't, of course, use your home address on this one. It has to be your place of employment. And just a couple of things I wanna mention about the, the DEA is um, when you go into the application site online, you will enroll as my dreaded word as DEA, as a mid-level provider, because you are also combined with physician assistants in their, their grouping. And the cost for your DEA currently is $731 for three years. Why I'm mentioning this is you might want to negotiate this with your employer on will they pay for your DEA if it's a required part of your practice um, or and some employers will do that. Others will say, I'm giving you so much continuing education money, you can use your CE money towards your DEA renewal or your DEA application. And then there also are some healthcare settings that the pharmacy has their own DEA number and providers that are employed by the hospital can also use the pharmacy DEA number and it just has a, a special number um, letter on there denoting that it, it is um, from the, the, the pharmacy's number, but they do know who the individual prescribers are. So explore that because it is a lot of money and the renewal is every three months. So when you do prescribe controlled substances at, at your state level, you are also required to participate in some type of a prescription prescription monitoring program for controlled substances. And again, this is something that varies from state to state. So wherever you're practicing, find out what that prescription monitoring program is. But it's a tool to track control, a tool to track controlled prescriptions. So when I prescribe a controlled substance before I hand a prescription to my patient, 
I go into the um, prescription monitoring program and look and look for that patient's name and who else might be prescribing that same drug for the patient. It works great within your state. Right now there still is, and I can't check if you leave my state and go to another state. I, I don't have a way of checking that. So if you're a border state, that's a little bit complex, um, more complicated. And some of the compact states where they do have really tight borders um, and with other states, not only do they share um, things with their nursing license and NP licensure, but they also share some of this with prescription monitoring. So just a note to keep that in mind um, when you do start prescribing controlled substances. There may, your institution may also require that you obtain an NPI number. That stands for National Provider Identification Number. And that is something that's obtained through CMS. There's an application on the web for that. And pharmacies often want that, even if you have all of your other license information on there, they want the NPI number because it has to do with being able to um, bill uh, um, the healthcare providers for the, the prescriptions. So collaborative agreements, if you're fortunate to work, work in one of the 24, 25 states that have full practice authority, you don't have to listen to this part of the lecture because you don't have to have a collaborative agreement. Um, but for the rest of us, we are required to have a collaborative agreement. And what that agreement or arrangement is, it does vary per state. So again, I would direct you to your state board of nursing and your um, NP um, state organizations for information, more information on this. But a collaborative agreement defines the level of physician involvement. If you work in a large healthcare system, they probably have a standard collaborative agreement that everybody completes. And then you just identify on that um, agreement what might be different for your practice versus you know, another colleague of yours. You cannot have a collaborative agreement until you have a practice address. And the, collaborative agreement is to be in place the very first day of practice. Um, and there's, again, various samples of the collaborative agreements on the website, so you don't have to worry about hiring an attorney to draft one up for you. There's great examples, and, and a lot of them charge you maybe $20, $25 to obtain a copy that you can then fill in with your own information. So we've talked a lot about all of the different um, license numbers and documentation that you are going to be required to track as a nurse practitioner. And you do want to have some mechanism for tracking of that data. Um, come up with a way of listing all your license numbers and then what are the renewal dates associated with that. Uh, for example, your RN license is every two years, your NP certification is every five, your DEA is every three, prescriptive authority, it depends on your state, but it, it probably coincides with your license, which is every two years. So I'm saying this because you cannot practice one day beyond expiration of your NP certification. You cannot prescribe a controlled substance one day beyond your DEA expiring. And I will tell you that if you change your address or your marital status, please let this grouping of individuals be the first to know because they don't come looking for you at renewal time. Um, the DEA, although it's federal, like the IRS, um, they send out a letter. If you've moved, it gets returned back to the DEA. They do not forward it. Um, that's where they're a little bit different than the IRS. The IRS will come looking for you, right? So track these numbers and know when your due dates are and start your renewal process prior to the date in case there are delays with incomplete applications, CE, whatever the requirement might be. If you work in a hospital system, departments like medical administration often um, track this data for you or help you track this data and they'll send you little reminders that your DEA is due in June, for example. Don't let them be your sole tracker of this information. You've worked long and hard to get all of these licenses, you don't want to lose them. So you should be the sole keeper of all this information. So in summary, 
we've talked today, we've talked quite a bit about required documentation that you're accumulating right now during your program. And be sure you take that with you in some type of an electronic file or a hard copy. You want copies of your syllabi, you want copies of your class schedules, you want your clinical hours, you also want to record, um, have a record of your procedures and how many you've observed, how many you have performed yourself, because when you go to hospital credentialing, um, you will be asked for that information as well. Your licensure, we've talked about the RN, NP, prescriptive authority, and DEA, how you obtain them, what are their requirements, their cost, and the importance of having them. And then we've talked extensively really about data management, keeping track of those renewal dates, that is really your responsibility. And then also tracking your continuing education requirements. And one pearl that I can share with you is that continuing education requirements vary between your different certifications. Some, for example, um, ANCC will have certain requirements that they want. The Heart Failures Association of Heart Failure Nurses that I'm certified by also wants certain requirements. And sometimes those align and I can double dip and I can use the same CE credit for both programs, but sometimes they don't. And so when you're looking at CE programs, look back at what your certification requirements are and make sure that you're going to get really the most for your money by taking the appropriate um, CE course. So. And at this point, I want to say congratulations to all of you and best wishes to you in really what is the most wonderful career you will ever have. And I have some references for you. And at this time, I will entertain any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deborah. Really great information, nice summary and overview for everybody, whether you're a new NP or not. So I learned some things today. Um, really wanted to thank you for the presentation. Really well done. So at this point, uh, we're looking for questions from the audience. Uh, please submit your questions via the questions pane in the GoToWebinar control panel um, to uh, ask a question today. We've had a couple come in so far, and I'd like to start with those. So we have Shirlene asking about how to apply for an MPI number and when should that be done? Okay, that's that's a great question. So applying for an NPI number is it's done through the Center for Medicare Services. So it's an online application. I probably wouldn't apply for it until I have my prescriptive authority and my DEA um, numbers and as well as having a practice site. And you may not have to apply for that. It's um, some employers require that you do that. Some employers will do that for you, which is wonderful. Um, I came from an era where I had to do all of my own applications and I would tell you that the Medicare application is onerous and you will not complete it perfectly the first time through. I think it's just designed to be that way. So if your future employer um, wants you to have one and they have somebody who is willing to complete that, I would say that's great because I've already done all these others. So I, that's how I would handle the NPI. Great. Um, and just a reminder, there have been some questions that have come up through the presentation about the handouts. <laughs> And as with the question bar uh, where you're chatting in your questions, just above that, you should see the handouts there that you can download um, during the course of this presentation. And as we said, it will be uploaded um, to Vimeo as well. Another question uh, comes from Melody. So Melody is asking, so should I renew my RN license when it is due as well as having a GNP certification? Yes, you have to. Uh, the Thank you, Melody. The question is, is great because you must always maintain your RN license in addition to um, your NP licensure. And some states have it that you renew them simultaneously um, and they have them on the same year rotation, which makes it a, a lot easier. But yes, you will always be renewing your RN license. 
now you'll just be renewing another your NP. Great, thank you. Um, a question from Meng. Meng is asking, I have a question. If you want to do CE for your NP, does it count for the RN CE? And are there CEs that count for both, for both your RN credits that you need and as well as NP credits? Um, another good question, Meng. And I, I specifically look at my CE requirements to make sure that when I do attend a program or I do something online or, or whatever, that I will be able to use it in multiple specialties. So there's no limit on if I attended a national symposium that I could not use that for my RN CE requirement as well as my NP and then hopefully some of my nursing certification requirements as well. The, what I'm cautioning you about is um, just watch who your certifying body is. And it, it tends to be one of my frustrations with, with nursing, and I, I wish we could resolve it. Because each certifying body, whether it's RN or NP, requires so many hours to be in a certain area, a certain category. So unfortunately, when you have multiple certifications, that's really hard to serve all of those masters. So what do I do is most of my credits I get as CME because all of them accept CME. And I've talked to leaders of um, national nursing organizations and said, you know, we're really shooting ourselves in the foot by making these requirements so tight when a lot of us have multiple specializations that we have to renew and we can't possibly have the time or money to get all of our contact hours in those things. So to default to CME is saying, you know, I'm harming my own nursing organizations by doing that, but sometimes that's my only alternative. And I hope that someday we can resolve that. That's great, and I'm glad you brought that up because it is true when you're attending any event, there will be RN credit, there can be CME, and there can be CEU. So you need to be sure that whatever you're taking is going to satisfy the requirements that you have for the, your program because you don't want to waste that CE time. That's a perfect, um, thank you for clarifying that, and, and, and I would add to that as well, look at the pharmacology requirements. Um, as well because you're going to have to have both for your RN and your NP pharmacology renewal requirements and make sure that they do meet NP requirements um, if you're taking that course. Great. Uh, next question is from Nancy. There's two questions. One is do you have any tips for negotiating contracts uh, which was part of a, of a lunch and learn that we did uh, last month. And the second one is, what is a normal non-compete clause in a contract? Can you negotiate a non-compete to be only about the specialty that you were working in? Hmm. Oh, two, two challenging questions. Negotiating a contract, I'm glad to hear that you said you had a webinar on that last month because that could easily be a webinar or a whole day seminar on that. Tips for negotiating. Um, if you're employed, like acute care NPs are predominantly employed in hospital settings, so sometimes there's not a lot of negotiating power you have um, because they have a set salary that they want to hire brand new practitioners at, and there's very little latitude in negotiating, in negotiating that. Um, but if you're going to private practice or another type of setting, I'd say you have significant latitude and I on now go up again this could be another um, presentation in negotiating the salary but I kind of look at I might be willing to start and I will be willing to start as a new graduate at a lower salary because I know I'm not going to be seeing your 20 patients a day in your primary care setting so pay me accordingly in the beginning but in six months I will be seeing 25 patients a day so I want to have a salary adjustment so I would negotiate that and, and kind of look at what are the levels of patients you'll be seeing, what's the average um, payment for a level two or level three or four visit, how many, what your combination is you think it might be, and base your projected salary on that. If they give you a lot of benefits, 
Um, it might be worth a lower salary if you don't have a lot of benefits, i.e. hospitalization, um, malpractice, et cetera, I would go for a higher salary because you're gonna have to pay those out of pocket. And okay. second question, um, trying second to remember. question was about non-competes. And I'm, I'm curious, um, because this is talking about, you know, what's normal for a non-compete and then can you negotiate it to be only in the specialty that you're working in? I would just like to respond to that real quickly that, <laughs> it would be somewhat unusual, at least in a first or initial job, to be signing a non-compete right out of school. Um, because basically what a non-compete is, is that you will not move to a competitor. So, I mean, in my personal experience, that's something that would kind of raise my eyebrows if somebody was asking me to sign a non-compete in my first place of business. And I would really probably wanna be asking more questions about why that's even in there because that's not typical um, to be, you know, in, in a contract. But I don't know, what, what, what are your thoughts on that, Deborah? Yeah, I, I agree, I would be a little concerned. Um, but I know that physician, physician providers also um, sign no compete contracts and often with their first employment contract. Um, I would just read that thoroughly um, because usually they make it that you cannot practice with it within a certain radius of their practice. So sometimes this forces a provider to have to relocate. So if that's not an option for you, then that might not be the practice you wanna sign on with, or you might want to negotiate that non-compete contract or that non-compete clause. Great. Um, Michelle is asking uh, initially, uh, what initial do you use once you're certified? So for the AANP, it's NP-C, or can you also use your FNP? So I guess once you're certified, I guess through the AANP, what would your credentials look like? I believe it's FNP-C, hyphen C. Hyphen, correct, I think you're right on that. Uh, another question from Shirlene. Most employers are looking for one year experience as an NP. Do you have any suggestions for new grads how to get past that hurdle? Wow, that's, a, that's another whole webinar. Yeah. yeah, everybody wants you to come in already trained. But you know what? The beauty of being an employer and taking a new NP is I can help mold you into that person that I want. You're not coming with um, any baggage, so to speak. So there's a lot of advantages to hiring somebody um, spot new from, from graduation. Um, I'm, I've just come out, I know the latest guidelines. I've, you know, my skills are um, up to date. Um, I see that a lot, but I think I, it would not make me as a new graduate not apply for something. I would still apply and then I would defend my reason why I thought hiring a new graduate would be better as opposed to um, someone who has a year's experience. What they're looking for is sometimes um, in some states and where I currently live, we used to have a clause where you did not have prescriptive authority and it was about a year of full-time practice before you could prescribe ind independently. And so they're probably looking at, they've gotten you through all those hurdles, you're ready to hit the ground and running. Um, and so if they're really insisting on somebody that has experience that, you know, and you can't sway them with your best, best argument, that might be a position then to pass up because they're not going to give you the time to um, transition from that student NP to the, the new practicing NP. So we've had some questions come up about Medicare and Medicaid and applying for them. One asks when to do it, and the other asks if you should do it prior to getting a job. I, I don't think you can do it prior to getting a job, either Medicare or Medicaid, because they require a, a practice address. Um, and I, I would hope that most of you are going to be employed somewhere, at least initially, um, where you'll have an office manager or someone who will do that application process for you. Somebody who's, you know, done it repetitively, um, like I said, it is onerous to do, it's not impossible to do, but they are two separate applications, but I do believe you have to have a practice address for that. So, and, and you have to have the PI numbers first too, so. Right, so uh, in my experience, I've never applied, you know, 
just on my own for those. It's always done through a credentialing department. Mm -hmm. That's after you've completed, you have your certifications and you have an NPI number. So it would be premature to do it before you have any of that done. Right. Um, and a lot of NPs start practicing and yet they're not able to bill for their services yet. And that's because it does take sometimes two to three months to get um, your Medicare number, your Medicaid number, um, Anthem, whoever all the other providers are, that is a, a tedious process. So often you're not billing independently in the beginning. You can still be working and seeing patients, but they won't be billing um, your services under your, under your number. There's a question from Alexis about how far in advance should we be interviewing? If, I'm, if we're interviewing for a job now before graduation, does an employer just wait until we pass the board exam? And I can actually speak to that real quickly because I've been in this situation with new hires where they have finished school, they've applied for uh, the you know board certification, but have not yet taken the exam. So in some cases, I know that we would offer employment contingent on passing the exam. So that is an option in some situations. I personally wouldn't tell you to put in a whole lot of effort to do your interviewing prior to taking your exams because I think most employers want to make sure that you've actually passed the boards because they're probably not going to be able to credential you without that. But your thoughts on that, Deborah? Um, I agree 100 percent and I have seen it done both ways in areas where there's a shortage of a particular type of NP or NPs in general. They will try to grab the new graduates as soon as they're completed their program and they will again hire them provisionally um, with the condition that you have a permanent position when you pass your boards. I have seen others will not even consider you for interview employment until you have your NP licensure showing up on the, the Board of Nursing website. Thank you. So there's a question here from Mark about reciprocity as an NP and is, is it a similar process to the RN, uh, how an RN works? And I'm guessing that what you mean by that is probably compact. So with RNs, there is something called the RN Compact where RNs can cross state lines to practice. You still have to have your RN in both states. There is no reciprocal reciprocity for NP practice. So I can tell you right now, this is a policy issue in Washington that we are working on and hoping to move forward because it prevents us from being able to, say for instance, if you live in Ohio, but you work in Pennsylvania, um, you may need to be licensed in both states, uh, or if you're working in both states, uh, you have to go through all the laws and the regs for an NP, which again, uh, can be onerous to do. But I wonder if you have any thoughts on reciprocity. I, again, agree with everything that you've said. And the, the one thing that I would add to that is, again, the difference between Ohio and Pennsylvania as far as their prescribing and practice as an NP are very different. So even though they share a common border, there's a lot of, um, unfortunately, there's a lot of differences. So again, I would refer you back to the State Board of Nursing website to refer to what their prescribing requirements are. Um, one example in Ohio, as a clinical nurse specialist, you can have prescriptive authority, but you go to Pennsylvania, you cannot obtain prescriptive authority. So they would not be able to practice with um, prescribing. I would take that one step further, and I, I know there's a lot of a lot of my colleagues go out of the country um, on mission trips and to do work, and you also need to be sure that you have uh, the medical malpractice that you would need, and any organization you go with, you need to check on their credentialing process to make sure what you're doing, you're doing legally, because I do know of people that have gotten into trouble on that as well. Um, we we are at the end of our time today. Uh, we had more questions, Deborah, than we were able to have you answer in this time frame. What we will do is anyone whose questions were not answered, we will forward them on to Deborah on your behalf, and we will get answers back to you in the very near future. So any other questions, if, if people are interested in hearing more about uh, the Nurse Practitioner Support and Alignment Network, the work we're doing here, or the NNCC, my contact information is listed there along with my colleague Tiffany DePew, 
who I work with here at the NNCC. If you do have any questions, also please visit us um, at our on our website. There's free training available at that www.nurseledcare.org. Uh, and we will also keep you apprised of CE opportunities that we have. All of the CVs that we provide through this program are free. Next month, or this month, next week, I meant, uh, we will be having kind of a follow-up to this discussion about the novice nurse practitioner and uh, turnover intention in a primary care setting and it will be presented by a colleague from George Washington University uh, DNP program. So on behalf of the AANP and the NNCC and also to Deborah for her work and taking uh, time to speak with us today, I wanted to thank everyone for joining us. Please remember that you will be receiving a survey about the webinar itself. Please complete that so we can get your feedback and um, then in a day or two, you should be receiving information about your ability to be able to go in and log in for the CE credit. Again, thank you to everyone for joining us today and look for the uploaded version of this on Vimeo. Thanks again and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.